save, being saved, and all the issues that relate to that. We'll be getting into that tonight and delving into that for the next few um, Bible study sessions. So, save, when we talk about salvation, when we talk about save, we, for the purpose of this um, this series of, of Wednesday night Bible studies, we'll be looking at the general topics. For example, what does it mean to be saved? Uh, when we use that term, because we use it broadly. Secondly, how does how is a person saved? How does that actually happen? And how do I know that I am saved? If I if I claim to be saved, or if someone says that they are saved, how uh, do we know? What what are the the, the, the signs that we, we know that we are saved? These are some of the general um, questions, general areas of this broad that we call seed or salvation we've been looking at. And it would help us to clarify this because it is basic being seed, but it also there are some advanced things that we need to know in order for our salvation, our relationship with God to be intact. Why saved? Why are we looking at this? It it really falls part of a broader category or broader issue. Uh, just as when we dealt with the whole issue of being, uh, whether we could depend on the Bible we have today or not, just as we spoke about the growth process and developmental process, this issue of being seen, it really falls into a bigger, uh, a bigger picture or a bigger uh, situation that we have in this day and age, this time we are living in, which is called the end times, uh, broadly described as the end times. Scripturally, the Bible shows us that one of the biggest challenges that will be faced in these days that we are living in and moving further is our belief system. In Luke chapter 18, Jesus made a very uh, simple but profound statement. He says, when the Son of Man returns, will he find faith on you? And when he, when he asked that question, he wasn't only referring to just simple belief in God, but he was talking, he was referring to an entire belief system. And so in these days that we are living in, and as we move forward in the weeks, months, and years ahead, belief system will become more and more the target of demonic spirits. And to make it even more um, clear, to make it clearer, in Ephesians chapter 6, the Bible says that we wrestle against uh, methodia, or the Bible calls it, another way you could translate that is deception. Uh, the King James calls it the wiles of the devil, but the Greek word methodia means deception. In other words, the, the, the warfare is really about a mentality and where, what do we really believe? It, to make it a little more practical, one of the biggest questions is who is Jesus? And that is paramount and also basic to our uh, Christianity and to our salvation. Who is Jesus? Then I will be talking about the question, what does it mean to be saved? Because many people use that word. But what does it mean? And is a person who claims to be saved really saved? How is a person saved? We'll be getting into those things. But other issues that are um, of importance, and more and more so as we come to these days, these end time days, the other doctrines of the Bible as a whole, doctrines about God and the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, uh, doctrines about sin on the whole, and things to come, what we call eschatology or prophecy. Those, those are issues which more and more, as we move forward, it, they influence our belief system. And the battle in these last days, in these end times, as we call them, is about a belief system. That is what, because Jesus mentioned that when I return, will I find faith? What is the belief system even quote-unquote believers will have? And of course, a general issue in these days and moving forward is all of the social trends that we face. All right? With the church in many years ago would have been very, very vocal against homosexuality, but no. It, it, there seems to be a little change in how we word in things and how we preach in, uh, about it and so on. So this whole issue about being saved and what it means is not just something that, that you're going to speak about in isolation. It really forms part of a broader picture. 
which which is what we kind of looking at in Bible study uh, since we started in, in the year. I will continue looking at the broader picture is our belief system. And a major, major belief system is the basic question about being free. All right. And so that, there's where we are going to, this is the broader picture. And the reason why we are zooming into this issue about being free, because it, it means that if we get this clear, being free, what it means, what it is about, if we get a clear in our minds, it will help us to get a correct belief system. And with a correct belief system, that will help us to position ourselves um, properly in these end times, these last days that we are in. So when we talk about this question about the NC, there are some 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 uh, some sub subsidiary questions or some smaller questions that we need to, to ask and we also need to answer in order for us to have a proper um, understanding of what the Bible means or what we mean when we talk about the NC. So the first question is, are you saved? And that is something that we always ask people who are uh, in the world, are you saved? I, I need to be saved. But I believe that there yeah, are some people who are quote unquote born again that need to really ask, we need to ask ourselves this question very, very seriously. Am I saved? And that would obviously lead us into, the, into these other questions. How is a person saved? And of course, what do we mean by being saved in the first place? What is the proper explanation for that? And how do I become saved? What does the Bible teach about salvation, which is what we will be exploring? And a little practical um, question for us is, have we, this is more of an evangelism question, have we helped or led someone to the place where they can be saved? This is evangelism. Have we done evangelism? And that question of evangelism, we will also be exploring that as we get into this issue of being saved. So being saved is, as, as we mentioned, Generally, you know, people use this, we use this, uh, this, this term, salvation or being saved a lot. And the purpose of these Bible study sessions, at least these few sessions, is to delve into the meaning of what it, of what saved or salvation is, what it means. Secondly, how do we become saved? And then the last broad and big question is, how do I know I am saved? The Bible, especially uh, the book of First John, the, the Gospel of John and the book of First John gives us very clearly numerous evidences or tests we can perform on ourselves to know whether we are saved or not. In the book of John, the Gospel of John, towards the ending, the last chapter, John says there are many other things that could have been written about Jesus. He says, but these things are written so that you would believe on the, on, his, on the name of Jesus and that you would be saved. These things are written so that you would believe on him and that you would have eternal life. And then the same author, John, when he wrote 1 John, throughout the entire book of 1 John, he gave many different um, examples or tests, things that we could, we, could, we could use to see whether we are born again or not. We talk about loving the brethren. And if we uh, walk in the light, that's a different thing. So the Bible doesn't only tell us that we need to be saved. It doesn't only tell us how to be saved and what is salvation and all these details. But it also gives us the test of how we can examine ourselves to make sure that we are saved. Because Jesus made a statement in Matthew chapter 25. He says, there are people who will stand before me and say, Lord, did I not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name? And Jesus said, he would say to them, I never knew you. Apart from, which is very interesting. He didn't, Jesus, in Matthew 25, he didn't say uh, that my words would be, I knew you once, but then you left. He, he, he wouldn't say, uh, I had a knowledge of you, but then something went wrong. He, what he would say is, I never knew you, which means that person apparently was never saved to begin with. And so it's a very important question. 
how do I know that I am safe? And so we'll be delving into those issues uh, for the next few sessions of, um, of Bible study. All right. Um, sorry to be late. Yeah. Good night, Franca. No problem. So these are the questions. So let's delve into it. What does it mean? What does it mean to be safe? In order to answer this question, in order to delve um, into this, this question of being safe, what we are going to do is actually take an overview of the book of Romans. Oh, I'm sorry. I think the just because somebody confirmed, I think the screen share just abruptly ended. Yeah, yes, it did. Uh, I'm just seeing your picture. Okay, let me try to bring it back up there. My apologies okay. for that. I'm not too sure what went on here. All right, let me share. So you should be seen there. Yeah, yeah it's back up. All right, thanks very much. So my apologies for that. So in order to, to really get a, uh, an understanding of, of, first of all, what it means to be saved, how is a person saved? The, what we are going to do is to give a broad overview of the book of Romans. I just briefly an overview, but in the, some, the, the initial chapters of Romans, we'll be getting a clear explanation from Paul about this. So, in essence, what I'm saying is we're going to do a study in, in, in a part of Romans to get an understanding of these basic questions. And then the second thing we'll be doing is when we go later on into looking at how do I know I'm seeing, we'll be doing a, a not in-depth, but a brief study of the book of 1 John. And this will be very brief studies. We'll just be looking at the exact verses that are relevant to us. Although we'll be looking at a broad overview, the depth and the deeper studies will just be in some places, not, in, not all, so that we could zoom into this issue of being saved. All right, so what does it mean to be saved? In answering that question, we're going to look at the book of Romans. To do that, I just want to give a broader overview of the book and then sort of zoom into um, some of the verses that deal with this question. Right. Uh, I think when we were doing this would have been a few months ago when we were doing uh, studies in Bible prophecy. We were looking at Romans chapter nine, and to do that, excuse, we did an overview just like this. So this would be kind of a, a repetition. This overview would be a repetition. In that previous session, what we did, we had zoomed into Romans nine, ten, and eleven. Today, we'll be zooming more into Romans chapter three. Four and five um, to get an understanding of, of this topic of being saved. So, Romans, the book of Romans, of all the books in the Bible, is really one of the, the best, well, we call it a book, it was a letter to the church in Rome. It is one of the letters Paul wrote, which gives us a very uh, comprehensive teaching and explanation on what this whole topic of salvation is what it means, and some of the practical applications and the practical consideration of this topic called salvation or BNC. Um, other letters Paul wrote had other main emphases, main focus, but Romans, its main emphasis is to give us a, an outline of salvation from beginning to end, and even future still. There are some prophetic um, statements Paul makes in the book of Romans. So with that understanding in mind, it can help us to see how Paul went about with the different sections in the book of Romans as he tried to explain the meaning of the gospel or the meaning of being saved and salvation. In the first few chapters, Romans chapter 1, 2, and chapter 3, what Paul did is that he started off his, 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 his explanation by showing that everybody is in sin. He started off explaining what sin is. He started speaking about everybody and, and proving that everyone, both the Jews, he was a Jew, as well as the Gentiles, who we today, uh, in, in, our, in our 
Caribbean area. They are classified in that category as Gentiles. But everyone, in the first three chapters, he showed that everyone have sinned. And Paul made a statement. Most of us could quote this verse. Romans 3.23. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. The, the, not not, not the, 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 just, when the Bible uses the term glory, it's not only talking about the beauty and the splendor, but it's talking about that position where we once were, that we once shared with God. We have fallen from that because of sin. And what Paul did is, in these first three chapters, he, played, he, he, he built a foundation and proved that everyone, all mm. mankind, we have sinned. And as a result of that sin, there are consequences. Let me just uh, look at chapter 3. So that we can all be on the same page. I said Romans chapter 3. This is what Paul did. He started off in the first few verses by showing that the Jews, actually from chapter 2, he showed that the Jews were in sin. In chapter 1, he shows that all of us Gentiles are in sin. Chapter 2, he shows that the Jews were also are in sin. And therefore, he concluded everybody, Jew and Gentile, in sin. But he went on later in chapter 3, and he made a statement that I just quoted, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. What Paul did is he went on now to explain if everybody, or since everybody is in sin, and everybody has fallen short of God's glory, there's obviously um, consequences for that. The consequences for that is that we are cut off from God. If we read chapter 1, Paul showed the consequences, how we fell from the knowledge of God. As a matter of fact, let me look at that, because it would... Uh, it would help to build a good foundation for getting into the understanding of the, the need to be seen. In chapter 1, Paul spoke about the consequences of being um, in sin. And why is it so serious? Why is it so um, destructive? He says, for the wrath of God, this is chapter 1, verse 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. So immediately, Paul is saying here, the, the, the reason why sin is a serious issue is because it incurs the wrath of God, the very wrath of God. Sin attracts, incurs, it demands the wrath of God to act. My faith, I'm getting a little ahead of myself, but I just want to make a point. My faith attracts or moves God to act on my behalf, but sin moves God to act against me. Even as a believer, if I sin, I cannot say that I am covered by grace. God will just look over that. God will move in my life against me because of that sin. And I want to explain that a little clearly. It, the sins that I commit, even as a believer, have consequences. And this verse in Romans is showing that the wrath of God, it comes against the sin. And notice what Paul says. The wrath comes against all ungodliness and all unrighteousness. He didn't make a distinction between people who are saved or not saved. All right? Because of Jesus, my sins are forgiven. But when I commit a sin today, if I sin today, that sin has consequences that I have to deal with, that I, that I will have to face. All right? And as we talk about this topic of being saved, we will get into the details of if a believer sins, what takes place, and, 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 and you know, how that works. Because you know, there are people who the question comes up like, am I once saved and always saved? So we'll be getting into those uh, those issues. But but I just want to, to, to get into this to, to, to build up a proper foundation. He says, the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. But listen to the last part. Who hold the truth in unrighteousness. In other words, Paul is specifically talking about people who know the truth, but still practice unrighteousness. They hold the truth. 
while practicing unrighteousness. And, the, and, and he is saying, on those persons, the wrath of God is real. And so he's talking about anybody who knows right from wrong, but still goes ahead doing what is wrong. God's wrath is released on them. And as a result of this wrath, as a result of this sin and wickedness or unrighteousness of mankind, Paul goes on to talk about the consequences of this. And here's what he says in verse 21. He says, when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither with thankful. But they became vain in their imagination, and their foolish heart was darkened. Paul, in this verse, verse 21, starts to show now the effects of sin on mankind. Mankind starts first with knowing God, and then begins going down, 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 and down. And in the next few verses, all the way to verse 31, Paul shows the general fall, the degradation, the, the downward spiral that results from sin. Now, the ultimate is the biggest consequence is separation from God. But what Paul shows here is that the consequences do not only relate to separation from God, but there are consequences in our physical body as well, and consequences in our relationship towards each other. Because of these effects of sin, what God did is he introduced something called salvation or being saved to deal with all of these consequences of sin and that, that is how we get into this topic of being saved it is necessary what god did by bringing about this thing called salvation was necessary to deal with all these consequences of sin and i also want to say that even when a believer sins today we there are consequences of those sins some people believe that, you know, because I'm covered by grace as a believer, when I sin, that does not affect me. And, and that is incorrect. As we go through these series of, of, of you know, topics under being saved, we will show and explain that even when a believer sins, it, that sin affects him. All right, so we show that um, a little later on. So with this basis, Paul is showing here that sin is not a light thing. It, 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 it brings the wrath of God. Not only does it bring the wrath of God, which is judgment and all that goes with that, but the sin itself has a direct effect on us. And in these verses, from verse 21 to verse 31, Paul shows the direct consequences. So let me put it this way. Sin has two different ways it, uh, it causes problems for us. One, it causes problems because it puts us in direct opposition to God and God's wrath is released on us. But the second way sin affects us is that the sin itself begins to affect us directly so that while we are receiving the wrath of God as a result of sin, the sin principle itself is also causing degeneration in us. Down and down and down. So these two things, the, the wrath and the degenerative process is working simultaneously when there is sin present. In order to deal with the wrath, in order for God to withhold his wrath, in order for God not to release his wrath on us, in order for God to deal with the degeneration that the sin principle itself causes, what God did is that he devised a plan which we call salvation. And what that salvation does broadly is that it reverses or it undoes, it uh, brings us back to the original state before the wrath of God was poured out and before the degeneration process began. And we will see that because that is actually one of the meaning of being seed. It means restoration. But this is why salvation is necessary. From here, what Paul then did is to go on now and start showing or explaining what this whole thing about being saved is about. And he did it coming way down here in chapter 3. This is what Paul goes on to say. He says in verse 23, as I read, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But then in verse 24, 
Paul makes the first statement which we want to focus on. So let me go back to the uh, to the PowerPoint. In this year, in verse 20, this is what Paul says. Therefore, we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. Paul uses this term, justified. And it is um, aligned or could be, could be used it, um, together with the word see. So what I want to do, I'm just going to put this word justified on hold for now. We'll take over, we'll come back to it. But I want to go to look at the word save the cell. And then we'll come back tied with this word justified and, and get a proper explanation for what the word, uh, what it means to be seen. When, uh, when the angel appeared to Joseph, Mary's husband, uh, Jesus' his father, when the angel appeared to him in a dream and the angel spoke to, 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 to Joseph. This is what he said to Jesus. And this is the first time we have this concept of being saved introduced to us. Right? This is in Matthew chapter, 20, chapter 1, verse 21. One of the principles, I think most of us probably uh, are aware of this, but I'll just say just to, to remind us. One of the, the, the principles in, in, in studying the Bible is when you see a concept or a word introduced for the first time, you, whatever is said about it in that context and whatever the description is about that word or that person or thing there for the first time is of utmost importance. And it will help us to understand how that word is used for the remainder of the Bible. Here, we have one of the first instance of this whole idea of being seen, uh, being spoken about in the Bible. And it was actually a prophecy given by an angel to Joseph. So the angel told Joseph, so he's referring to Mary, and he says, she shall bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he shall save um, his people from their sin. The, the, the name Jesus, there and the, and the, the word save are actually synonymous. Just to give a, uh, a brief explanation, the word Jesus is a Hebrew word Yeshua and it means saved as well. It talks about a savior or a person who's a deliverer, someone who will give help. So he, he is saying this savior or this person who will give help will save his people from their sin. So the first thing I want to mention when we talk about what does it mean to be saved is being saved is related to sin. And, and, and that's a very important point to me. When we talk about being saved, the idea or the whole issue of being saved is related directly to sin. Being saved is not related directly to making money. It is not related directly to having a prosperous business. When I say I am saved, that doesn't mean that God is not going to automatically give me success and what the um, um, projects and, and goals I have. The meaning and the first and main focus of being saved has to do with sin. The word itself, save, as you see here, we put so and it means to keep something or someone safe. It means to deliver. It means, this is a very interesting meaning, to make whole. And a little more practically, the word save or sozo in the Greek means to preserve someone or something from danger, from loss, or from destruction. And we need to keep in mind that this is related mainly to sin. And that is important because one of the, the, um, the applications or one of the things we, we, we speak about today very regularly is because I am saved and because I have this uh, relationship with God now, God going to uh, automatically bless my business and, and, and he's going to automatically give me a happy life. 
and we we have that saying because we have this thinking that salvation is really about success on the earth here and salvation or being saved is about a good life on the earth here and that is not the correct biblical understanding of salvation salvation or being saved deals with the, the consequences or the effects of sin when we go to romans when we went to romans just now in romans chapter 1 we saw the effects of sins there remember we it spoke about the the, the the degeneration man started to go even down and down and down so the first thing we need to to uh to hammer on and the first foundation we need to 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 put in place as a come as a related to the meaning of sin is to be seen it relates to sin it relates to uh being delivered or being kept seen from the effects or the consequences of the sin and that is something which i believe we today have become desensitized to many of us even in the church have become desensitized to the the dangers and the uh the the the, the state the poor state of living in sin and consequences of sin one of the things that when we read in romans in romans chapter 1 one, one of the first thing it mentions is when they knew god they glorified him not as god but they became vain in their imaginations and it shows one of the very first effects of sin is on our thinking on our mentality or belief system which is why we focus on our belief system so much sin damages our thinking and it damages our mentality we become vain in our imagination vain means unproductive futile in other words we get thinking which does not benefit us actually is the opposite we have thinking that destroys us and because of this 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 effect on our thinking that is even many of us in the church have become so desensitized to how 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 much god hates sin and we have become desensitized to how destructive sin is that we lose the 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 all and we lose the joy and we lose the gratitude to god for this thing called being seen let me put it this way people you know we have this saying you never miss the water until the well runs dry in other words you don't know what you have until you lost it kind of if we apply that principle to this year many people because we are desensitized to the effects and the consequences of sin it causes us not to have a real appreciation for salvation because we don't know what we really have because we don't even we don't have an appreciation for what we lost and if we did we don't have an appreciation for what we lost it means we wouldn't have an appreciation for what jesus won for us when he was on the cross and that is why when we get into this thing called being saved the first point is being saved relates to sin and what do we mean by that it relates to the effects consequences the issues that sin caused in our lives and we get that from romans chapter 1 right so see the word itself one more time means to keep someone safe it means to deliver deliver someone from the sins from the effects the, the 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 consequences of those sins and one of the things i really like here is the word save means to make whole in other words it is bringing a person or bringing back a thing back to how it should be so when we talk about the save we are talking about not only uh being forgiven and i'll get into that in the next slide but we are talking about being restored to where we were originally and that is being whole once again all right and of course it means to preserve someone from loss excuse danger or destruction 
the word save, as used in the Bible, is a very um, rich word. One of the words in the Old Testament that, in the Hebrew, sorry, that is kind of similar in its practical meaning to save is the, is the Hebrew word shalom, which is called peace. And that, and that word shalom means kind of like the same thing here, wholeness or soundness. So in the Old Testament, when God was dealing with, with, with Israel and he was trying to, to get them into his peace and to experience relationship with him and the peace with him, that actually was the same concept of what we call salvation today. What God was doing was preparing them for this thing we call salvation or wholeness or soundness. So let's just go back to to that passage in, 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 in Romans, which is where we're taking our, um, our cue from as we go along studying this topic about being saved. We said the word save itself means sozo, it means deliverance, or it means to keep safe, or it means to make something whole. That word, um, save, sozo, is also similar in terms of its, 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 its concept to this word justify that Paul used in Romans chapter 3, verse 20. They have different in, different in meaning, but the, the, the function of the two of them is similar. So, so let me just explain what, they, what justified means to make it a little more clear. Therefore, Romans 3.20, we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. The word justified is this, this Greek word here, the kaiu, and it means to bring out what is desired. That's very interesting. Justified means the thing that is being justified is not doing anything for itself or on itself. It is somebody on the outside working on it. So if I say that I am justified, it means, first of all, the word itself implies I am not working on myself. It's an outside source working on me. And that outside source is bringing out or doing something in me to bring me to the place where the source wants me to be. And so that's the first thing with justification, which is similar to what the angel told Joseph. Jesus will save the people. He's the outside or the external source working on the people, which is what justification means. It is an outside source working on us. And of course, the source there is God. So justification means to bring out from the person, bring out what you desire from them. You doing the work. Justification also means to declare a person righteous. And this is very important. Justification means, so, so if, if, if God, not if, but when God sees a sinner and that sinner repents, God makes a pronouncement based on that person's belief in the finished work of Jesus. God then makes a pronouncement or a declaration. That person is now righteous. Or another way we could put it, that person is now in right standing with me. It is a declaration God makes. God, um, because of a person's faith, uh, Romans 3.20, it says, a man is justified by faith. Because of my faith or my belief, in the finished work of Jesus on the cross, and only because of that, God takes my faith, he takes the finished work of Jesus, and then God is legally and uh, not only legally, he is just to now come and declare, make a pronouncement this person is now in a right relationship with me. We could use the example of a judge in a court. When the judge gets evidence to show that the, the, the accused is innocent, 
and the if there's a, a a jury, they also look at the evidence and they determine that the accused is innocent. The judge will then make a pronouncement, take the gavel and, and hit it and declare, you know, the accused is now free. He is not guilty. When the judge does that, he is making a declaration. He's making a pronouncement, not guilty or free, whatever they be. The, the exact statement is, I can't remember. But he is declaring or making a pronouncement. The mm. reason why he could make that pronouncement is because there was evidence to show the person is, 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 is innocent. In our case, the evidence mm. is the sacrifice of Jesus, the finished work, and our faith in that finished work. And when God sees the faith and God knows that the sacrifices are completed, with the two come together as evidence on our behalf. That we are we are innocent, and that is what justified means. Justified is a declaration God makes. It is a pronouncement which God makes on our behalf, um, and this declaration, this pronouncement, is also it is similar to when we we use the term being saved or I am saved. It means. If we were to put the two together, when we talk about save, let's just go back to the previous slide. Save means to be delivered or to make whole or to preserve from danger, loss, or destruction. That's exactly what justification means. It means I am declared innocent and I am now put in a right position and a right relationship with God. When the minute I put faith in the finished work of Jesus, that, that pronouncement happens immediately. I am justified. Not because I did enough things to become justified. I am put in a right relationship, a right uh, standing with God. Not because I did enough of what God required me to do. The only reason I am put in a right standing with God and the only reason why I am now safe and delivered from the consequences of my sins is because of my belief in the finished work of Jesus. Let me just mention one thing here. I kind of get in ahead of myself. But I just want to make a point while we are here. I am not saved. And again, the word saved means delivered from the consequences of my sin. I am not saved because I pray a prayer of repentance. That does not save me. I am not saved by receiving Jesus in my heart as my Lord and Savior. And I ain't know that that's a common prayer. We tell people to pray. Do you want to receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior? The scripture doesn't say that. The scripture says, if you believe on the Lord Jesus, and then you confess with your mouth, Romans chapter 9, chapter 10, verse 9 and 10. It's salvation or being uh, put in a right relationship with God does not happen by praying a prayer. As a matter of fact, praying a prayer out loud is not even necessary. Salvation or justification, being delivered from the consequences of my sin and now being right with God, it does not happen by receiving Jesus in my heart. Actually, I really don't want to, this is my personal, uh, personal point or personal position. I don't understand what it means to receive Jesus in my heart. Because I, I guess people take that from, from Revelation where it says, I stand at the door and knock. And if any man, you know, hear my voice, open the door, I'll come and I'll stop with him. But I don't understand what that statement in Revelation has to do with receiving Jesus in my heart as my Lord and Savior. And also, I don't understand what it means to receive Jesus as my Lord and Savior. because. The scripture 
doesn't talk about receiving him as Savior. It talks about believing on him. Is a belief system. The whole thing about being saved and the whole thing about salvation is not what we do, but is what we believe. So when I say, when a person asks me, David, are you saved? And my answer is yes, I prayed the prayer and I repented. What I just said there is I did something. And because I did this, I am saved. And that is actually opposite to what salvation is about. Salvation is about faith, being saved. And again, the word saved, it means, as we saw Suzu, it means to make whole, to be delivered. Salvation comes by faith. So when somebody says, you know, I prayed that prayer already and I repented already. Um, I remember the altar and I kneeled down and I prayed. Everything in those statements referred to things which that person did. And we cannot do anything to be saved. The only way we are saved is by belief in what Jesus has done. And and I'll get to that in a little more detail later. But I really think that that's an important point to hammer in here. Being saved, it comes as a result of faith. So let's let's try to put the two together, justification and and seed. I just try to get a a, a, a little practical understanding of what it means to be saved. To be saved, saved, means to be placed in right relationship or right relation towards God. To be saved has nothing really to do with becoming successful on youth and having a a growing business and a successful ministry or or job or whatever the case is. Salvation has to do with our relationship with God. So when I say that I am saved and know that I am saved, I expect that God will prosper me on the earth. That is the wrong thinking and a wrong understanding of what it means to be saved. To be saved means firstly that because I am delivered from the consequences of my sin, one of the consequences is the wrath of God is released. Now that I am saved, there's no more wrath, but now I have a right relationship with God. Secondly, the the, 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 the effect, remember we said, from Romans chapter 1. When we sin, there are two things that that we have to deal with. There's the wrath of God, and then there's the sin principle itself, which continues to work in us. So when we are saved, the wrath of God is no longer released. I now have peace with God. I have a right relationship with God. But the second thing is that the sin principle itself is now dealt with in me. So I am delivered from the consequences of sin. And the consequences here means not only judgment and punishment and hell, but it means the effects of sin in me, my physical body, my mind. All these Talk about that a little more as we go through it in the book of, 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 of Romans. And to be saved means to experience restoration or wholeness. Salvation, being saved, being justified, what these things speak about is being restored. And that is the power of salvation. To save, to deliver, to restore, what these things refer to is not only preventing us from facing further judgment and further punishment. But in addition to that, we are now restored to where we were. So we could put it this way. To be saved has two aspects still. It has a negative aspect and it has a positive aspect. The negative aspect has to do with the fact that we are no longer looking towards judgment and punishment. All those things was released on Jesus. So we don't have to look towards that. The positive aspect is no, we are restored. It is not only that we no longer have judgment, but 
purata that we are now restored to where we were. We have wholeness once again. And that is the, the idea behind being saved. I want to, uh, to, to bring out this point. What Paul did after he spoke about these things in chapter 3, uh, we have all sinned and, and you know, all these different things. He then went on to say this, make this statement in chapter 5. He says, therefore being justified by faith. Or well, we could say this way, therefore being saved by faith. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. This peace with God, we could put it in another way. We have a right relationship with God. Salvation or being saved is firstly about relationship with God. To be saved doesn't mean that now I am forgiven so I can expect God's blessings on my house, on my house or my health, or my family. That comes later on, but that's not the meaning of being saved. The meaning of being saved is having peace with God now. Why peace? Because remember, there was wrath before. Because of his sin, the wrath of God is released. No, there's no more wrath. What there is now is peace between us and God. And here we are now getting into the effects or the benefits of being saved. We will look about, we will look into that in much more detail next week. But I just want to kind of uh, kind of segue into it from tonight. The, because we are saved, which again means we are delivered from the, 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 the consequences and even the power of the sin itself, the sin principle, the automatic result of that is we have peace with God because God no longer holds you and I accountable for the sins. When that was uh, Easter weekend, on, on, on Friday, Good Friday and Easter Sunday, one of the things we looked at there was the, the finished work of Jesus on the cross. Jesus did a finished work. Today, right now, he is doing an ongoing work as our high priest. And I just put in a little plug. There's a future work Jesus is going to do where he will function as our kinsman redeemer in, in, in Revelation chapter 6, chapter 5 and 6. But the past work, the finished work, is when he was on the cross. And on that cross, when we were talking about this on Good Friday, the full judgment of God for every sin that was ever committed before Jesus, in the day Jesus was alive, and in the future, even what is future for us, every sin was judged on Jesus completely. And because he was a sacrifice, and as a result of him receiving the judgment, and not only receiving the judgment, Romans. 1 Corinthians chapter 5 tells us he became sin itself when he was on the cross. When anybody places their faith in that sacrifice, in other words, when a person believes, makes a decision in their own uh, mind, in their own thinking, and believes that Jesus is the only sacrifice, and that Jesus suffered for me, and that Jesus took my place completely and nobody else but only him that is the only way a person becomes saved it, 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 salvation comes as a result of a change in our belief system so I want to just want to mention it again and re-emphasize it nobody is saved because of praying the sinner's prayer nobody is saved because of accepting Jesus, because they say, Jesus, come into my heart and be my Lord and Savior. Because when we say, come into my heart, when we say, be my Lord and Savior, in none of that are we saying, Jesus, I believe you're finished with. In none of that are we exercising our faith in his death for us. What we are doing is just simply praying a prayer. Now, some people might say, well, 
if I ask him to be my Lord and Savior, the very fact that I'm asking him to be my Savior means that I believe he died. And I'm not disputing that fact. But one of the issues is many times when people pray that prayer, the person leading them in that prayer do not explain to them up front about the sacrifice of Jesus. And they need to have faith in that. What we generally, generally tell the person is just pray this prayer. The person who was on the cross, one of the, the um, convicts or thieves who was on the cross with Jesus, when he saw everything and he believed in Jesus, all he simply said was, remember me when you come into your kingdom. The fact that he said that and the response that Jesus gave showed that his words really came from a heart condition of belief. It came out from a belief system. What was the belief? He recognized on the cross that this man called Jesus really was the Messiah. And that on the cross, he was the sacrifice for his own sin as a thief. And, and that is the crux of salvation. That is the crux of being saved. It is what belief system do I have? And as a believer, I'm not going to I'm going to end now. But as a believer, if I, let me, not as a believer, as a sinner, if that person doesn't have a belief that Jesus and Jesus alone is the sacrifice for my sin, and he alone was judged completely by God for my sin, he could pray how many prayers of repentance, he will never be saved, he or she. Because there are people who are considered converts in the church. They are considered born again in the church. And they are added into church membership. But these people come into the church, believe in Jesus and believe in the Bible. But simultaneously still hold on to the beliefs of their former life. To be saved is not about praying and prayer. It's about a belief system. What is the belief system? Is believing that Jesus, number one, is the sacrifice on my behalf. Number two, he, he, he faced the full wrath of God on my behalf. And number three, he was spotless. He was holy. There was no sin in him. And so when he died, it was a perfect sacrifice. And now when I put faith in him, when I believe that he died, and I believe he was perfect, and I believe that he was judged completely. The sins which I have committed is now judged on him. The perfections that he has is now released to me. And it is at that point of believing that I am seen. Whether or not I pray a prayer verbally is not issue. It's a belief system. It's a change in what I believe. So, and, and also, b- b- before I am, if a believer in his walk with God, later in his walk with God, starts mixing faith in Jesus with work and trying to do things, then he enters into a dangerous state in his Christian life. Anytime a believer starts adding things that he's trying to do, Together with his belief in Jesus, that's a dangerous thing. And it brings us into the question of what really going on with some believers who live in by works and some believers who add in together with the Bible, they also add in real beliefs from other religion and other um, teachers that they hear it. Because that's what's going on in this end times. In this end times we live in, there's so much belief system. And the world has given us so much uh, nice sounding teaching and, 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 and lifestyle and reason for living a particular way. that many of us as believers are kind of getting into the thinking and the belief system that the world has. And we're mixing it with what the Bible says. When you read the book of Galatians, Paul was angry because of that. And the danger is some of us doing it today. And so later on, we will get into that. We'll see how 
sometimes we mix in belief system. And when a believer begins to mix belief system, what's really going on with his salvation? Yeah. There's a, there's a very important question. But for now, the first thing, at least for tonight, is what does it mean to be saved? And we, we looked at us, let me just pull up this slide and I'll end here. To be saved means to be placed in right relation with God. It means to be delivered from the consequences and also the power of sin. And it means to have restoration, for God to bring us back to where we were originally. And how that happened, how it happens, sorry, the Bible tells us clearly it is by faith. Uh, it is by faith on the finished work of Jesus, not by praying a prayer. It's not by telling Jesus to become our Lord and Savior. All of that is all well and good, but it must be based on a belief system. And it's a belief in his finished work and his alone, nothing else. And of course, that's tied closely to the word justified. And so, so when we come uh, in the next session, what we're going to do with this foundation of what being saved means, we're then going to look in a little more detail of how we can explain it tonight. It is by faith, but I want to get in a little more depth of how is a person saved and then challenge us to check whether we are saved or not. Because we'll be looking into the scriptures and see evidence of being saved. And it will challenge us to check ourselves.